All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us on the last day of the webinar series. Um, today we'll be looking at the impact of cosmetics on the ocular surface, sure. and we have um a world-renowned key opinion leader who's going to um do justice to this topic. Um, today promises to be quite educative. Um, we're very um privileged and happy to have um Dr. Rashna with us today. Um, over the um week, we've been discussing um the way lifestyle impacts the ocular surface. We've looked at contact lenses, societal challenges. Um, we've looked at um, environmental conditions, nutrition, lifestyle challenges, elective medications, and the digital environment. Today, we'll be looking at cosmetics. Now, this is something that we all get um, every time from patients. Um, we um, see it, I see it on the slip um, um, with eyeliner pigments floating or um, false lashes or lash glue or um, certain skin products and how they may affect the ocular surface. Today's the day you get your answer to that and how it affects the ocular surface. Our speaker for today is um, Dr. Rachna Muthi. Um, she's a multi-award winning consultant ophthalmologist. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, Dr. Rachna um, was educated at the Imperial College of Science and Technology. And um, she's also completed a post-residency fellowship at the Moorfields Eye Hospital and the Craniofacial Unit at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, um, both in London as well. Um, Dr. Um, Rachna, um, before entering full-time private practice, led the Cambridge um, University Hospital Thyroid Eye Disease Service, where she provided care for um, a huge part of the East England region. Um, her service has been recognized internationally. Um, she's won multiple awards. Um, her interests lie in ocular surface, um, ocular, um, ocular reconstruction, and also in ophthalmic aesthetics. Um, Dr. Rachna is um, also um, a medical aesthetic expert and practitioner um, with interest in restorative and regenerative treatments um, for not just the eye or the ocular surface, but the face as well. She's um, a key opinion leader for several leading uh, industry um, partners that we know about, and we're very, very privileged and lucky to have her in our midst today. Um, Dr. Rachna, um, you're welcome. You may share your screen. I'll just stop sharing mine. Lovely. Thank you. That was a wonderful introduction to me. Thank you so much. I'm just going to get my screen share on and um, just make sure that you can see what I'm seeing as well. So, yes, uh, we can see your screen. That's great. So, well, thank you once again, Doctor. That's a really lovely introduction. So I am um, going to speak to you all today about what I think is the elephant in the room. So we see our patients who come in with um, ocular surface disease and dry eye disease, and they sit at the slit lamp. And as you said rightly, you know, we see little particles of makeup or cosmetics, and it's not just the females. And, you know, we don't really know what our patients do after we see them and we do the treatments for their dry eyes and we prescribe their drops. We don't know, unless we ask what they do at home, what they're using around their faces, what other treatments they're having done. And so I'm going to talk to you um, about what um, I'm not being biased when I'm saying this, but I, I think this is the most important of the lifestyle um, TFOS reports. And it was the most read and hardest hitting one last year uh, when it was published in the Ocular Surface Journal. I do encourage you to all read. And uh, this, you'll enjoy reading this, but it is 57 pages. So I'm hoping to summarize this for you in this presentation today. Um, and I'm very open to take lots of questions. So it's going to be a very nice, quick presentation for you. So I have no conflicts of interest, but I want you to start first of all by just imagining, and you can look at this picture, or you can just close your eyes and just imagine a door-to-door -door salesperson. And this salesman is going from city to city, town to town, village to village, knocking on the doors of your neighbors, knocking on your door. And he has this lotion in his hand, this shiny bottle 
and he promised to take 10 years off your face to remove all of those lines and wrinkles and frown lines and make your eyes bright and shiny and help you to see better. And it's something that everybody is interested in and it's not expensive. And so sure, you're interested, aren't you? And you're not even interested for yourself. You're interested in buying some for the whole of your family. And you take the bottle in your hand and you turn it around and you look at the list of ingredients and it reads like a foreign language. Now, I'm not talking about the 1800s like this picture. I'm talking about what is happening right here, right now, every single day, reaching the doors of your patients, reaching your doors, reaching your children's doors and through social media, through the television and through all the media outlets that we have access to. And this is modern day cosmetic marketing and it is hitting us and our, our families every single day. And it's not a small market. So this is a huge growing market um, and it's a multi, multi-billion dollar industry. And it's not just uh, limited to women, although statistics show, and these are some statistics for you, 90% of women under 55 wear some form of cosmetics in the UK. And I'm sure this is very similar globally. And actually it's been acceptable for uh, men to have some form of grooming habit, whether that's cosmetic or skincare or shampoos or deodorant. And so the personal men's care uh, market is, is over $120 billion. And this was in 2020, so it's increasing exponentially. And if you just look at the eye care market alone, that was over $15 billion in 2020. So the projected market value is going to be huge, over 23 billion by 2028. The most common products that are used are mascara to highlight eyelashes, eyeliner to draw on the eyelid and eyeshadow to add color to the eyelids. And it's not just adults, so it's reaching our children as well. 54% of girls aged 12 to 14 in the US wear some form of eye makeup. And I'm sure that this is a common practice in your homes as well, and in your hometowns. So we haven't just recently become preoccupied with the eyes, we've always been preoccupied by the eyes. And we know from the 1970s where gaze tracking studies were performed by this Russian scientist called Alfred Yarbus, where little electrodes were attached to uh, two individuals and they monitored where the eyes focus on when we communicate with people. And what happens is that the eyes will scan the face and they will move from eye to eye to the nose and transiently look at any imperfections or scars, but rest back on the eyes. And so we communicate with our eyes and we are preoccupied with our eyes. And, and it's very important uh, since antiquity to be able to adorn the eyes and eyes were used to speak. So you'll know about black coal and that's still used worldwide and it had products like lead sulfide and antimony which were poisonous substances. Atropa belladonna, you see this last picture on the right hand side with a dilated pupil in, in ancient Roman times from the deadly nightshade plant was used to dilate pupils. We still use it as an eye drop for examinations and for treating children uh, with amblyopia. And so these organic products are naturally occurring, but they can also be toxins. So organic doesn't necessarily mean it's good for you. And cosmetics have evolved over the centuries. During the medieval times, uh, between the fifth and 15th century, the church outlawed cosmetics, but they became popular again. And as, as the uh, futures uh, started evolving, the 20th century saw commercialization of products. And you'll have heard of these names, Elizabeth Arden, Max Factor, Helena Rubinstein. That's when the first commercial um, eyeshadow products started uh, coming about in the 19, uh, early 1900s. And it was Mabel Williams from the company that's now known as Mabel, Maybelline or Maybelline, who created this product called Lash Brow Iron that later became mascara as we know it. And so this has gone on for you know, over, over nearly a hundred years where we have cosmetic products that are commercialized. And of course the cosmetic market has now expanded to include all sorts of things like 
botulinum toxin, fillers, lash extensions, lash serums, laser, and it also includes cosmetic surgery. Um, and so there are multiple things that our patients will be doing that you need to be aware of and how it can impact the eyes and the ocular surface. And the main problem is that cosmetics are very, very poorly regulated and they're not assessed for safety, unlike surgical procedures or unlike certain lazy laser procedures. And even Botox and fillers in, in most countries are well regulated, but cosmetics are very poorly regulated. And there are very few ingredients that have actually been assessed for safety. In the USA, they have the FDA that um, will assess things for safety. And they estimate that over 12 and a half thousand uh, 12,500 chemicals are known to be present in cosmetics, but only 11 ingredients have been banned in the USA since 1938. In the European Union, uh, and in UK is included in that uh, just about still, 1,300 ingredients have been banned, so slightly more restrictions, but still it's a small fraction compared to the number of chemicals that exist and ingredients that exist in cosmetics as we know them. So less than 20% have been reviewed for general safety. Now, if you imagine that you were getting in an airplane, for instance, that had only less than 20% of the safety checks done, you're not going to get on this airplane, are you? Yet we are very happy to put products on our faces and around our eyes that have not been assessed for safety. And the other problem is that there is a real paucity of clinical data and clinical trials. And even less reviewed has been the effect on the periocular and the ocular surface. So this is where the TFOS uh, Lifestyle Committee came in. There's uh, 16 of us, and you'll see myself in, uh, in one of the pictures. And we got together, um, and it took three years to do a, a massive literature review. And these are global experts who were invited to join the subcommittee. And we did a, a literature search and we picked up all of the high level evidence. So you already know that there is very little evidence and paucity of data, but we, we picked up the highest level evidence and we produced this narrative literature review that included also the history of cosmetics as well. And so it does make for a very interesting read. And um, this this is the, the publication uh, which you can take a look at in your own times. And so we know that cosmetic ingredients um, can cause adverse effects from our reading. It can cause all sorts of things, including ocular irritation and allergies, contact dermatitis around the eyelids, blepharitis and inflammation of the eyelids. It can affect the meibomian glands and the corneal surface, and they can cause uh, problems with the fat around the periocular area. They can cause dry eye disease. And worse still, they can be endocrine disruptors, which are either estrogenic and androgenic that can also affect the ocular surface as well as the general well-being of the individual. There are neurotoxins in many of these in ingredients and there are carcinogens as well. So these have higher impacting uh, problems than just the ocular surface. But we're focused on this uh, summary on the effects of the on the ocular surface. And the other problem we have is, you know, when you turn that bottle around, you looked at the back of the ingredients. This is the same for most cosmetics. If you have a look at what's written on the back of your labels of your products that you use on a day to day basis, you'll see that they are if they are listed at all, they will read like a foreign language. So how do you know what it is that it contains and how do you know whether or not there is anything that can be nasty in the products that you're using? The. TFOS lifestyle report went through every single cosmetic ingredient that had high level evidence. And this is a simple list of the top 10 makeup nasties, which you're welcome to take a picture of um, or a screen uh, uh, capture of. And I'll be talking about a few of these uh, shortly. Uh, but you'll see some of these that are listed here, you'll know about from many of the things that you use on probably a day to day basis in your eye drops like benzalkonium chloride and perhaps even using tea tree oil um, to treat blepharitis. And in, paradoxically, these things can actually cause worse eye disease and ocular surface disease.
So let's take benzylconium chloride, first of all. This is a preservative, and preservatives are essential in, in many things because they are bactericidal, and we need to keep bacteria at bay for things that are going on the ocular surface. They are seen in many cosmetics, including eyeliner, makeup remover, and mascara. And they are toxic. Uh, BAC is toxic to the cornea, conjunctiva, and the meibomian um, gland epithelial cells. It's also an allergen, and so it can cause irritation to people who are on glaucoma drops, and it can cause irritation to people who use cosmetics. It's an irritant, and it has a very long half-life. And the concentrations that are required to be toxic to the ocular surface are 20,000-fold lower than what is allowed in commercial products. So the concentrations going in every single day are very, very high. So these products are used on a daily basis around the periocular area. Eyelash glue is also a very nasty offender. And eyelash glue and many products contain formaldehyde-releasing compounds. Formaldehyde, as you'll know, is used as a preservative um, and it was used to preserve cadavers for dissection and it's also present in many, many cosmetics, in shampoos and mascara. And these are toxic, again, to the cornea, conjunctiva and the meibomian glands. Not only are they allergens and mutagens, they're also carcinogens. And again, the concentrations that are required to be toxic to the ocular surface are 2,000 fold lower than what is allowed maximally in, in products. So these are nasties to be aware of, and I'm sure you've seen many of your patients who have attended um, to your clinic rooms where you've seen um, lash extensions and the, the results of this. Parabens are seen in many products. Parabens are, are products that are contained in glitters and in the eyeshadows and in lots of serums. Again, they're toxic to the ocular surface and the eyelids, and they can also disrupt um, the endocrine system. And so they can cause uh, feminization of men who use products around, or boys who use these products around their, their face and their skin. It's also genotoxic and is a potential carcinogen as well. I'm sure you've all heard of bimatoprost. Bimatoprost is a glaucoma drop that uh, was used at a much higher concentration than is available currently. And it was noted in 2008 that, or before 2008, that people who are using bimatoprost got longer eyelashes. So the company Allegan that makes these drops and uh, made those drops rebranded um, Bimatoprost as Latisse, as a lash serum, but this was available as a prescription only product for those people who had loss of lashes for, for reasons such as cancer treatment. Now, these same prostaglandin analogues are present, uh, present in over the counter lash serums, and so they can be used on a daily basis for lash elongation, and there are many different products available. Um, these pictures on the top are two patients of mine that I was treating in 2009 with unilateral glaucoma. And you'll see that the, the eyes on the, on the left, which is the right eye of the, the patients, were red. There was a, sun, a sunken upper sulcus and longer lashes as well. And these patients, um, I started noticing when I was treating these patients that they were losing the fat around their eyes. And this is now a well-recognized side effect of bimatoprost. And even three years after stopping their glaucoma drops um, and, and changing to a different glaucoma drop that was not a prostaglandin analog, those same effects still were present. Now you'd say that maybe the concentrations are much greater when you're putting it in an eye drop and the absorption is much greater. But remember these uh, lash serums are used uh, multiple times a day sometimes uh, by our patients. And so they can cause similar, similar side effects. The things to look for in the ingredient list are the starting point of PROST, and or meristyl pentapeptide, which is a very common ingredient that acts like a prostaglandin analog and can cause these similar side effects. 
So how do we advise our patients and what, how can they look to see what is in their products and their, their cosmetics that they use? There are some websites available and you're welcome to, again, take a, a screenshot of this. Um, there are some apps as well. And there are some apps that allow um, you to scan the barcode to see what ingredients are present. And the EU does uh, insist that ingredients are, are listed. And so even if you can't see them on the, on the product label and you can't understand what they are, you're able to translate that language by using some of these available apps. So we need to be making our patients more aware of the techniques and how we can help to inform them to look after their eyes better it's no I, what i say to my patients is no point me doing a treatment for them and and then if i was a dentist they would go home and brush their teeth every day but what they need to do is to look after their eyes with the skincare or the products that they're using around their eyes every day and that also means that they would need to consider safety and changing over to safer safer practices Retinols are very commonly used um, in skincare to improve skin quality. And there are many of my patients who are on regular retinols. And unless I ask them whether they put them right up towards the eyelids, then we are not going to know. Retinols can cause uh, my bone gland dropout and worsening dry eyes. And so it's important to ask whether or not they're on a retinol, uh, which is used to boost collagen around the skin and it's used as an anti-aging ingredient and advise to avoid using retinols near the eye in patients that you have, um, that you're seeing with sensitive eyes and ocular surface disease. Another common technique used with cosmetics is to apply eyeliner to the wet dry junction. This is called water lining. And this, as you can see in the pictures, can clog up the meibomian glands and it can migrate to the ocular surface. In fact, particular eyeshadow can contaminate the tear film uh, which is a peak at 10 minutes after application. And so this can be an irritant to the eye surface and it can also clog up the meibomian glands. Also, waterproof mascara is very commonly used, particularly if people want to avoid reapplying their makeup. And this requires more astringent removers, so alcohol-based removers, which can also be very drying to the periocular area. So it's worth advising to switch over to um, non-waterproof cosmetics. So education is important and we must all start the conversation about cosmetics with our patients. We have to learn ourselves how to read the label before we can advise them how to read the label. And so I've given you some ways to be able to uh, arm yourself to provide some translation for your patients. Remember that herbal and organic and natural doesn't have a legal definition and doesn't always mean that it's safe. And consider limiting the use of products. There's an aggregate toxicity of multiple applications of multiple different cosmetics multiple times a day, every single day. And that's going to be at concentrations that are far greater than what's been shown to be safe to the periocular area. Consider swapping out ingredients. So swap out prostaglandin analogs for safer lash conditioners. I would suggest perhaps uh, encouraging people with sensitive eyes not to use prostaglandin analogs at all um, and swap out waterproof mascara for non-waterproof, as I said earlier. Um, advise about techniques. And if you see that there is mascara and makeup in the uh, tear film, then you know, that's it's that's the first warning sign about uh, what techniques can need to be or, or need to be changed. And um, advise patients about discarding uh, their products regularly, replacing them within three months. So these preservatives exist for a reason and there are safer preservatives other than formaldehyde releasing compounds. And some of those apps will, uh, will direct towards safer cosmetics. You see a picture here of a, of a range, product range, uh, Eyes of the Story. And this is actually uh, the brainchild of, of uh, the TFOS um, cosmetic uh, leader of, of the cosmetic report, David 
Gallant Sal David Sullivan and his daughter Amy Gallant Sullivan has made this range and my patients love it. I'm not sure whether it's available in Africa yet, but I'm sure it will be. And it is a very, very wonderful uh, range of cosmetics, which has not, luckily for Amy, got any of the cosmetic uh, nasties that we found in the report. So I'm going to bring this talk to a close and I'm going to open this up for any questions. I know it's been a whistle-stop tour of this. This is uh, Jonathan Roos, who is also a co-author of, of the, uh, the report and is my business partner in London in Harley Street. And I'd like to thank you all for attending the last of the TFOS reports on an evening and uh, giving your time to hear me speak about this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rajna. Um, that was really interesting. Um, I guess when we close early, <laughs> you give a lot of room for questions. So, um, so I'm going to um open the floor for questions. Um, we already have one question in the chat section, so I'll just um read that out, and then um, as others come, we'll take them. Um, so the first question is um. Along with, um, alongside darkening and elongation of the eyelashes, does bimatoprost cause hyperpigmentation of the periorbital skin? Yes, that's right. It does cause hyperpigmentation of the skin, and it can also change the uh, color of irises as well. So that can become darker or lighter. Um, so there's also hyperemia and redness uh, associated. So you'll, sort, you'll remember from the pictures that I showed that there is quite a lot more redness on the sides that patients were using the mimatoprost. Um, and also uh, the topical application resulted in superficial loss of the fat. Interestingly, and I don't know whether anyone's going to ask about this, um, as a result of my findings, and I presented this uh, very early on, um, at a big oculoplastics meeting. And I, I saw a lot of patients uh, with thyroid eye disease because that was a specialist interest of mine. I suggested that if patients with thyroid eye disease have glaucoma, that we might consider using bimatoprost as a drop because it can reduce some of the, uh, the fat hypertrophy. Um, and there was a big PhD study performed by uh, somebody else. And unfortunately, they didn't find any, uh, the results were equivocal. But I, um, since then, more studies have gone on and, and prostaglandins and prostaglandin analogs have been used and injected into the fat around uh, the periorbital area. And it does cause fat atrophy. So it's worth considering using these drops uh, for your thyroid eye disease patients who have glaucoma if they have a hypertrophy of the fat. Well, thank you so much. Um, that was really interesting. Um, so the next question deals with something that we um, often ask you about, and I even have questions about that. What about hypoallergenic versus non-allergenic um, um, products? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question because, you know, they always say, and I, I have to use this inverted commas, ophthalmology tested, but what does that even mean? Because we know from this report that um, many ophthalmologists don't even know about cosmetics, let alone the things that are in the cosmetics. And, and if something is hypoallergenic, then basically that has been a small study. You don't have to do many studies to get cosmetics regulated and there is no regulation. So um, unlike injectables, which go deeper than the skin surface, cosmetics do not need to go through stringent testing. So they can even just get five patients or five people to, to put these products on their face. And if they have report no issues of sensitivity, then it, it can be classified by an ophthalmologist as hypoallergenic. So I'd just be wary and um, regardless of products that state that they're ophthalmology tested um, and just check the ingredients for your patients and, and advise them to look at these websites. Thank you so much for that. Um, so the next um, question would be a follow up from what you just answered. Um, in the course of your slides, you had listed um, ways we can identify some of these um, toxic agents. So could you go back to that and maybe yep. throw more light on that slide? So yes. uh, uh, let's go back to that. So yeah, so there in um, the 
EU, they have um, more regulation and uh, there, are, there are apps, which is this NC Beauty app and a code check uh, app, which allows you to scan the barcodes. Um, also, there are some product ranges which uh, aim to provide um, ingredients that have been uh, tested better for safety. So Paula's Choice is a cosmetic range, for instance. And, and I think it's if there are product ranges that claim to be um, eye safe, then they but at least started the conversation and started looking to, looking at ways of reducing uh, toxicity. Um, but it is still very difficult because we don't have much data, and because there's been very little st uh, studies of of all of the ingredients. It's very difficult to say without long-term studies and case control studies, how much of these ingredients are going to affect the eyes. We just have to know that our patients are using products. We need to have that conversation. We need to advise them if they are using products that are known to be uh, causing sensitivities as per the list, then it may be worth switching out or avoiding using them around the periocular area. Thank you so much for that. And I think the previous slide before this showed like the 10 most offending um, agents. Um, could yeah, we I'll see that again? Back to that, yeah. Um, I, I reduced my, yeah. my picture there so you can see it. Yeah, so I mean, uh, these uh, peptides are neuro neuropeptides. The argelene is used in products that help to reduce lines and wrinkles. Uh, it's It's classified as a topical Botox. Um, benzalkonium chloride, as you already we already sort of touched on, is used as a preservative. Carbon black is present in many pigmented um, products. And chlorphenicin is also a preservative, uh, as is formaldehyde and all of those formaldehyde-releasing products. And actually, formaldehyde exists and existed for a long, long time in baby shampoo. So I don't know how many of you still continue to recommend the use of baby shampoo for treating blepharitis and inflammation of the eyelids. Johnson's baby shampoo had to take off their product from the market because for, for many decades, that was the treatment of choice by ophthalmologists um, to treat blepharitis and it contained formaldehyde releasing compounds. They've now changed their, uh, their shampoos for baby shampoos and they don't contain these anymore, but they're, there are better ways of cleaning the eyelashes and treating um, blepharitis and using baby shampoo. Um, and so try and avoid any products that have formaldehyde releasing compounds. Um, we talked about prostaglandin analogs and parabens and alcohol containing products are drying to the meibomian glands. And of course, retinols are also drying to the meibomian glands. And then tea tree oil. So many oils are toxic to the cornea. Um, and although tea tree oil is something that can um, eradicate demodex, it's pretty strong if it's going to kill bugs around the eyes. And so this is probably another topic for another day, but demodex mites are present along the lashes of um, people who have blepharitis. And those mites are not the, the reason for inflammation. It's the bacteria that they carry. And I think we spend a lot of time trying to eradicate demodex mites when uh, it may be better to be controlling the microbiome and, and doing this in a safe way and using products such as hypochlorous acid, which is becoming um, much more of a gold standard treatment for uh, improving the microbiome load around the periocular area rather than going to something very nasty and strong like, like the tea tree oil. So if it's able to kill demodex mites, it's killing a, a lot more around the eyes as well at the same time. Well, thank you so much. And um, of this list of 10, which would you say, um, do you feel some are more um, offending compared to others? Um, which would you say um, is the worst of these? Yeah, I think that certainly the ones that are carcinogens and endocrine disruptors are, are systemically likely to cause uh, long-term problems beyond the ocular surface. And so definitely formaldehyde and the parabens um, are, are, the, are the things to watch out for. 
And the others are also nasty for the eye area, and which is of interest for us. But in general, I think for our families, for ourselves, uh, for our children, future generations, we have to be wary of these other nasties that can have far more out, uh, worse outreaching effects. Well, um, I mean, in, as as you spoke, um, you mentioned about um how formaldehyde is present in um baby shampoo. And um, I'd be willing to bet there's still a lot of eye care practitioners who still prescribe dilute baby shampoo. Um, it'd be interesting to study um, awareness or um, that current practice, um, if that's still being practiced and um, how much of it is being practiced, how aware eye care practitioners, because um, that might form basis for um, probably some other educational program um, going forward because absolutely I... yeah i think you know that you're absolutely right you know this this is only the beginning um of a global project and sort of improving the ways we treat and mitigate um from uh, ocular surface disease and just looking at practices currently first and providing more data and, and running more studies is, re is going to help to shape the future treatments. Well, thank you so much. I mean, um, I, I remember trying um, cleaning my lids with baby shampoo once and um, I understood why the compliance is poor. Yes, yes. All right, um, so the next question, um, I'll just scroll over to that. So are there any recommendations for removal of makeup for patients? who have um, particles embedded um, maybe on the um, ocular surface or on the conjunctiva or the lashes, what sort of makeup removers would you recommend for patients? Yeah, so that's again, another excellent question. Um, so waterproof um, products are usually difficult to remove. And a lot of the makeup removers contain alcohol and that is, really drying to the eyelids and the eyelid glands. There are safer products, um, which are things like micellar water, which is um, a mixture of oil and, and uh, a, a solvent uh, or a water base. And it is much less drying to the ocular surface. And so that, that would be the first, uh, what I recommend to all of my patients to remove makeup. And it's much safer to use around the periocular area. But also oh, switch you. out, switch out from the waterproof um, mascaras and waterproof makeup, and try and use ones that are uh, less long lasting. Thank you so much. And um, as you as you talked, um, you mentioned um, sort of um, more um, long lasting um, um, eyeliners or um, um, waterproof eyeliners, um, and how they can be more difficult to remove, and you require alcohol-based products to remove. So, are you um advising um that we advise our patients against using um waterproof um eye makeup? So I think we have to uh, be aware that you know our patients have their own minds. They have they will make their own choices. We can only give advice. If they come to us with sensitive eyes, then I think we have a duty of care to advise them that actually, you know, there are alternatives and they will be willing to listen to you because you, you are able to educate them as to safer practices. But there are people who don't have sensitive eyes who um, will continue to use these products, but you can, you can still educate them. And, you know, it's, it, 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 it'll be a shame for them to say 10 years down the line, well, I was never told this. Um, and so, you know, it's our duty to give the advice and we can only hope that they will take the advice that we give them. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, so the next question um, sort of touches on what you just mentioned. How do you get um, patients who may be sensitive to these um, um, products and do not want to let go of these products. How do you deal with such scenarios? Yeah, it's it's very difficult when you don't have an alternative. And I think the first thing is that uh, I'm fortunate now that I can suggest alternatives, um, but, but you can also suggest safer alternatives. Um, and so, for instance, Switching away from using lash extensions um, to mascara is a first step. 
because lash extensions have these uh, lash glues, which are really, really nasty to the lashes in general. And um, it becomes a vicious cycle. They will use the extensions. And, you know, I've, I have tried lash extensions in my time as well. And I, and I know that it's a very common practice. And unless there was an alternative and I was educated about it, then I wouldn't consider it an alternative. Um, but you can only advise. And so advise about having a break from these products, even if it's a short break, it's it's good to give the areas, the eye area rest, trying safer things. So mascaras that don't have, um, that are changed regularly, that aren't you, that aren't waterproof, you know, all of those sort of switching out to safer, safer products and avoiding the things that dry the periocular area, just stick to using those products around the rest of the face and not around the eyes. Thank you so much. Um, as you um, as you spoke and you mentioned um, um, how we may give patients alternatives, um, sometimes, I mean, if I had a dollar for every time a patient walked in and they were already using something like bison to clear out the redness or some other vasoconstrictor, I mean, it's something that's common practice. But the next question sort of touches on that. Um, are there any uh, medications that sort of may counter the um, side effects or the complications that we notice from this um, um, makeup? Yeah, no, there is no medication that can get, so you're, you're putting a drug on a drug, essentially. So the best and first step is to um, stop the practice or to reduce the practice. I did mention hypochlorous. Hypochlorous is a product that I became interested in um, a while ago, and it was a, a treatment that optometrists were becoming aware of in the US uh, for a while, and it's now being used more globally. I don't know whether you have access to hypochlorous products mm -hmm. there, uh, mm -hmm. but it's, it's very quick acting. It's very safe, and um, I, have, I personally have developed a product uh, with a company in the UK, which is um, a pH um, stabilized for the ocular surface. And so it's not made by electrolysis, it's made by phosphate buffering, which means that it doesn't leave a residue on the eyelashes. And so somebody who has stopped the products or uh, had a break from the products that are causing the irritation, and then they have an anti-inflammatory so some, sometimes, you know, some a few drops of steroids can help for a few days to reduce redness. And in the short term, that's the safest thing to do rather than uh, um, hitting, hitting things very hard. But take away the nasty things first before you start attacking it with, with, with steroids and hypochlorous. Thank you so much for that. Um, so the next question um, sort of, is um deals more with um a chemical reaction than uh, makeup. Um, do metals or plastics that are used in spectacle frames um affect the ocular surface? I, I mean the periorbital skin. Yeah. I guess that's what they mean. Yeah. So again, that's a good question, and there wasn't much data about it. But we did look at eyelash curlers, for instance. You know, eyelash curlers are metal curlers, and you know people have had contact dermatitis with with uh the curlers. And it's the same with uh, spectacle frames. And so plastics tend to be more inert, uh, but plastics that are not cleaned regularly will have microbiome loads on them that can cause infections. And metals such as nickel, and uh, and many patients are allergic to nickel. Uh, in fact, I've seen it um, on the bridges of, of glasses with, with patients that come um, and there, there is an increased bacterial load and there's a lot of inflammation that causes irritation around the nasal bridge area. And so, yes, it's a, it's a good to look at the glass fitting and what the glasses are made of as well, because that can also contribute to dermatitis. Oh, thank you so much for that. So the next three questions after that um, basically deal with the same issue, mm -hmm. lash extensions. I mean, you couldn't talk about um, cosmetics and the ocular surface without dealing with lash extensions. So um, could you tell us um, more about lash extensions and how they affect the ocular surface? That's one. Yeah. And um, are there any safer options in terms of lash extensions? Um, you yeah. mentioned... Um, probably using a lash coiler or a mascara, um, but 
Um, yeah. Are there safer options of flash extensions compared to others or different types? And yeah. what kind of damage does it do to the ocular surface, including the glue as well? Okay. Okay, great. So I'm just going to break up that question uh, a little bit. So the lash extensions, the, the primary um, uh, nasty is the glue. Um, and that's that's because it's it's like a cyanoacrylate glue. It's um, it it is something that releases, and you can smell it. You know, if you've ever used uh, cyanoacrylate glue to glue objects together, it's a very strong smell, and that's the formaldehyde releasing compounds. And this is the stuff that you wouldn't put your on your fingers to stick your fingers together. Yet uh, people are applying it to their eyelash eyelashes uh, many times when they have their lash extensions. Um, so the glues around the lash extensions, as well as the, there's a, uh, very often when people have lash extensions put on, they will have a, a sticky tape put on underneath the eyelid to protect the lashes uh, at the bottom, sticking to the lashes at the top. And that sticky tape will often have a glue on it as well, which is uh, quite toxic. And the fumes from that can, can burn the ocular surface. Um, sometimes the extensions are attached individually to the lashes, and so those those lashes can get into the ocular surface. Uh, they can get on the ocular surface. They can get uh, trapped underneath the eyelid. Uh, they can also come as strips. Um, and so the first thing is actually um, there are safer alternatives. You can get temporary lash extensions. So there are a lot of companies uh, and drugstores are now um providing at home use temporary extensions which has more of a paper glue rather than a, a stronger cyanoacrylate glue which is not ideal but if used as a temporary basis because that's all they're used they're not there for they're not they're not there for long term use um that can be safer the long term lash extensions have to be removed and if they're not removed then very often patients will pull them off which also is not very uh, good for their general eyelid hygiene and their eyelashes. Another alternative, which we looked at in the paper as well, is that there are some magnetic lashes, but they have um, they've been shown to cause some uh, degree of ptosis. So one of the problems that we didn't talk about in this and we didn't report on, but I've seen in patients, is that very heavy extensions can result in uh, a mechanical ptosis. And so, you know, that's something that people are using these products to improve their aesthetic and their appearance, but in the long term, they can actually make things worse. So, Well, well thank you so much for that. Um, I'll go to the next question. Um, I mean, far worse, far worse than that. Sorry, 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 far worse than that. I've actually seen somebody who has put um, glue into their, cyanoclate glue into their eye because they thought it was their um, antibiotic ointment. But <laughs> it's not the same as wow. a cosmetic nasty, but it, it is a, a nasty thing to happen. So, you know, they, yeah. they look very similar. <laughs> yeah. So I guess um, the labeling should carry um, maybe a huge one inside or a color-coded cover. That exactly. might help. Exactly. Um, so the next um, question is, um, I mean, we've touched heavily on what products are not good, what products are not safe. Um, can you touch on um, what would you consider the ocular safe cosmetic products? I mean, you talked about um, Amy Sullivan's um, product um, and you mentioned um, the hypochloric um, acid um, lid wipe. Um, can you yeah. mention others? Yeah. Yeah, so... Um, the most common cause for meibomian gland related um, ocular surface disease is rosacea, um, certainly in the sort of Western world and um, products that um, are applied topically that can help reduce uh, inflammation around the uh, skin of the face as well as the eyes. Um, hypochlorous is the main one. Uh, Amy Gallant Sullivan's products don't uh, yet have hypochlorous, but the uh, she also has a facial cleanser and a serum, which doesn't have the preservatives that are seen in these nasties. And they can also reduce uh, redness and inflammation. Um, really eye-safe products. Um, many people use hyaluronic acid uh, around their, their eyes. 
I have found that a lot of my patients feel that this is more drying. So hyaluronic acid on the periocular area can draw out water from the ocular surface. So it 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 is uh, it, the opposite of what you want to achieve. So in in general, I advise patients to stick to um, safer products. So vitamin C is 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 relatively safe on the skin uh, as long as you don't go up to the eyelashes. So I advise really leaving a space of about four or five millimeters from the lash line with any product that goes um, on the periocular area, because we see migration of products by five millimeters as patients sleep. And so it's it's got to be uh, a safe distance from the eye, from the eye surface. Uh, thank you so much. And um, so the next is, I mean, sort of a question, but also I think um, an area that we can all talk on um, and collaborate on. Um, the cosmetic industry is huge. I mean, look at the numbers you mentioned um, for sales of cosmetics. I mean, the yeah. year 2020. Yeah. Um, is there a room for collaboration between industry and eye care practitioners um, so that we can produce safe um, cosmetic products? Yeah. Brilliant question. Again, um, this is the era of um, safe beauty. It's no longer clean beauty. And cosmetic companies are wanting to join this tidal wave. But um, th there isn't collaboration with eye care practitioners. And uh, I know uh, Amy well, and I know that she is finding it hard to have the industry large industry partners um, open their eyes and pay attention to the cosmetics because it's not of interest to them. It's not a big market. So something that is safe for cosmetic, uh, as cosmetics for sensitive eyes is not a great market for them, but they are becoming more aware. And I do think that the future will involve some interested industry partner to take the lead on this, and then they will all follow. Well, um, I, I totally agree. And maybe if we got some celebrities to talk about it or talk about their experiences with maybe some symptom using such makeup, maybe yeah. that might yeah. push um in um some of these influences. Yeah, absolutely. Um, influences first and celebrities and then getting the big players to to take note. So all the La Roche Posay's and all the L'Oreal's and the big brands are becoming interested. Even Dior has a science group, but it just needs them to pay attention to the eyes. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, um, you talked about being cautious about parabens. Um, are there safer variants such as uh, methyl parabens or polypropyl parabens? Yeah, they're all um, uh, much of a muchness. And I think parabens on a whole, we are trying to uh, remove from many things that we use. And so I think that uh, that parabens became one of the first things that were restricted and, and banned in product. And so um, if it says there are parabens not present, it means that at least that company has looked at uh, that ingredient I think on the whole, we need to be avoiding parabens because they are carcinogenic. Thank you. Um, the next question um, is quite interesting. Um, do you think um, sensitivity to cosmetics um, are maybe gender specific or race specific? I don't think there is any gender specificity or race specificity, but I do know that there are certain practices and products that still contain lead and other uh, around the world. You know, many of these toxic ingredients that have been banned elsewhere continue to exist. Um, females have five times higher risk of getting dry eye disease. And there are several reasons for this, but one of the reasons may well be that there is a higher use of cosmetics in the female race. Hormones do have an impact on ocular surface disease as well. And so we do see higher rates of uh, perimenopause of dry eyes and during pregnancy as well, but cosmetics have a big impact on this. And so we can improve that fivefold increased risk by um, advising our patients about safer practices. 
Thank you so much for that. Um, the next question sort of touches um, on the gender aspect of things as well. I mean, we've talked heavily about eyeliners, eye makeup, um, mostly things which women will do, lash extensions. Um, but um, for men, sometimes um, you apply an aftershave, especially for someone who has a lot of facial yeah. hair yeah. or hair sprays or things like yeah. that. And all yeah. these things contain alcohol. They do. Um, they do. And you... also, sorry, sorry to interrupt. No, go ahead. No, yeah, go ahead. Also, okay, you throw more light on that. Yes, you're you're spot on because um, many uh, shampoos will contain tea tree oil. Many shampoos will contain formaldehyde releasing compounds. You know, men do use grooming products, whether they don't use cosmetics as such, but they will. You know, you will use products around your skin, and the alcohol in the aftershaves um, will be drying. The the formaldehyde in the shampoos will be toxic and uh, it will run to the face as well. So it's it's important to pay attention to all the products that we use. Thank you so much for that. Um, so the next question deals with microblading um, um, of the brows. I, I'm not sure what other areas um, people might micro, microblade, but how does this affect the ocular surface? Yeah, so we didn't actually find any data on this. Um, microblading, if, for those that aren't sure, and I think I, uh, I'm right in, in talking about this practice, is where uh, pigment is put into the uh, eyebrow area to give the appearance of, uh, of eyebrows. And so um, a lot of the pigmentary tattoos that we did find data on were used in eyeliners, uh, for instance, the permanent eye makeup, and uh, many of those pigments um, showed meibomian gland dropout and were uh, a risk for ocular surface disease. So the pigment um, often would change from black to red or black to green with time. And um, these tattoos used in the periocular area are, are, are toxic. Being in the eyebrow area may be safer than being directly on the uh, lash line, but it's still a risk to the periocular area. Thank you for that. Um, so the next question um, says, considering, um, okay, I think we talked about microblading already. So the next question looks at um, um, something called um, cajun water, which is basically alkali water um, as a form of facial cleanser. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think that will do to the ocular surface? What effect would that have? Okay, well, um, our skin is naturally slightly acidic um, in pH. The ocular surface is neutral in pH. Anything that is alkali or acid on the ocular surface is going to sting, first of all. We know that alkalis can penetrate the eye and can co coagulate proteins, and so, it's going to sting, first of all, um, and it can, depending on the concentrations and the pH, it can actually penetrate deeper and it can be harmful. Um, we didn't find any data on it, but it is something that needs to be considered amongst as harmful as getting concrete in your eye or plaster in your eye, so potentially, and so care needs to be taken. We don't need to alkalize the skin. Our skin should be naturally slightly acidic. Thank you so much for um, that answer. Um, I think that brings us to the end of the number of questions. I mean, it was um, very interesting. I mean, we learned equally from the question answer section and the presentation. So this was really, really interesting. Thank you so much, Dr. Ashna. Thank you. Um, if you could stop sharing your screen, yep. I'll just share mine. And um, okay, thank you. Okay, um, so once again, we're very, very grateful for your time, Dr. Rajna. This has been really interesting, and I'm sure we've all benefited. Um, the recordings for this will be made available at the um, iAfrica Media um, YouTube page, um, where you can go back and rewatch the lectures. The um, um, reports are free to download from the T-Force website, so feel free to download those. Um, also remember to fill out the um, surveys from the T-Force Dry Practice Survey. Um, those will be sent um, via email um, um, from CIFI. 
So try and fill those out. We'd like to know how dry um, is being managed um, in different parts of the world. So we want Africans to participate so that we have good data and we're able to formul uh, formulate um, educational programs that will help uh, with this. The TIFOS Deuce 3 workshop is also coming up in Venice, Italy in October. Um, if you're interested, um, there are more details on the TIFOS website. Do well to attend it. Um, it be very educative. Um, also, if you're interested in reaching out to Dr. Rachna and you want to ask questions or you want to learn more about how cosmetics can affect the ocular surface or about her work, um, you could go ahead and email her. Um, I'm sure she'll be um, happy to help out with um, whatever questions you have. Um, if you have questions about the presentations or the TFOS um, CFI webinar series, um, go ahead and email me. I'll be happy to um, answer your questions the best I can or send you to the experts in the different um, subcommittees. Once again, we thank you all so much for taking out the time um, over the past eight days um, to attend the webinar series. Um, this is the last of the webinar series and um, what a way to end the series. Thank you all so much for joining in. Thank My you. <laughs> all right, then. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Rachna. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.